In part three of this series on the Pi Pocket Phone 1, I shall be taking a closer look at the receiver unit. As I mentioned in part one, there are two variations of the receiver. The early version had a transducer in the top and a plate aerial. But it wasn't very loud, so the later version had a loudspeaker in the top and a significant bulge here to accommodate it. Other than that, they were fairly similar. So I'm going to look at them both interchangeably. I'll remove that one for now. And we'll concentrate on this one. As with the transmitter, there are two screws holding the back of the case on. One of them is countersunk. And the other one stands proud. I don't know why. Why that has to be so obtrusive when they could have fitted a countersink one. Now, unlike the transmitter where you remove the front on the receiver, you remove the back. And the, the bugbear here is that the back tends to get stuck on that aerial. There we go. There's a there's a slot in there that the aerial fits into. So there we have the receiver. Receiver Mark 1 with the plate aerial. This shows the set with the battery in place and as you can see there's not much spare space. I'll show how the battery is reversible. See these contacts? You can turn the battery round. And the positive contact is in the center. The negative is on the outside. Both of these outside ones are negative. So whichever way you turn it, the negative always contacts that pin. There is a slight problem with this. These could twist slightly, so you could end up like that, with it not contacting very well. The receiver is a double conversion superhead, with a first IF of 10.7 megs and a second IF of just 100 kilohertz. This unusually low second IF was presumably chosen for two reasons. Firstly, it allowed the IF to use simple RC filtering, down here somewhere, instead of bulky coils. And secondly, it meant that the deviation, especially on the 50 kHz sets, was an appreciable proportion of the IF. This allowed the use of simple pulse counting detector, again avoiding the bulky coils associated with a ratio detector. So let's look at the set starting with the aerial. On the early sets, the aerial is a perforated metal grill at the top of the set. I'm not sh entirely sure how it's supposed to work, but given the presence of this ground plane here, I presume it was meant as a short capacity loaded monopole. However, given the off centre feed, it probably acted a bit like an inverted L at the same time. So the polarisation was probably mixed, which would be a good thing. On later sets, the loudspeaker is used instead of the perforated grill, but the principle is the same. Here's the later set for comparison and as you can see there's the loudspeaker and it's connected through to the receiver the same way as the original. The original plate was slightly bigger. Other than that it's pretty much the same. All the RF and first conversion functions take place inside this substantial screening can. I'll show the inside of that in a moment. It has holes 
for tweaking various things, but a couple of the trimmers could only be accessed from the underside of the board. The can was held on with a couple of tiny nuts at the top and a couple of tiny nuts on the underneath. In this example they've either got lost or strip threaded and uh, it's been soldered up. This, this is quite common. This is what it looks like with the can removed. In this case I'm using the loudspeaker model because the can was already removed on this one. The aerial came in here and it was tapped well down this first tune circuit which was a high Q tune circuit in its own little screening compartment. Let's have a look at the tap. You can see that's the hot end of the circuit and that's the cold end and it's tapped it's tapped well down there. Now also tapped in there is the RF amplifier transistor which sits in the in the screen, straddles the screen there. I think it's a common base circuit with the emitter on this side, the base going to the shield and the collector coming out here. This shows the aerial connector coming in, tapping to the bottom of the coil and there's a capacitor here also coming from that same point, going to the emitter of the transistor. In this case, it's a 2N4255, which is a strange choice. Usually it was a BF180, and the collector goes there, and you can see there's gaps in the can for resistors and things to go down into the, uh, into the printed circuit board below. So from the collector of the transistor there was a, a tuned circuit loosely coupled through this capacitor to another tuned circuit. All, this is all at signal frequency forming that formed a bandpass filter. From there it went into the first mixer which was a BF181 along with the signal from the first local oscillator and multiplier unit which is round here. The first local oscillator uses an 88 MHz crystal whose precise frequency could be adjusted by this coil designated L2. From this tank coil a diode created a comb of harmonics of which the fifth, around 440 MHz, was selected by this tune circuit here, tuned by capacitor C18, which was accessible through the top of the can. This was then fed, the 440 megs was then fed into the first mixer. Original frequencies, this was low side or subtractive mixing, which means that the image frequency 21.4 megs below the wanted one often fell in the 70 sems amateur band. So if you were lucky, you could pick up a set with exactly the right crystal. For your favourite 70 sem frequency. If you had to buy a crystal, it was prudent to use high side injection for 70 sems, keeping the oscillator and multiplier stage in their original tuning range. So the, the frequency of the crystal was the carrier frequency plus 10.7 divided by 5, which usually came out in the 88, 88 and a half meg region. From the first mixer, the 10.7 was selected and passed through this coil here, designated T2, and an 
IF amplifier, first IF amplifier tr transistor, and then through the crystal filter. This had a bandwidth of plus or minus 15 kilohertz for the 50 kilohertz say, spacing sets, or plus or minus 7.5 kilohertz for the 25k spaced ones. This red one with the designation 03208 was a 50 kilohertz filter. The later 25 kilohertz filter was designated 03219. But there's also other filters. I think they're all made by Cathodian. But uh, this one, for instance, has got a different number on completely. I think it's 412. Oh no. Vodian filter, not a Pi one. There's another amplifier on the output of the filter. That's a 10.7 megs. A 10.7 meg IF transformer and a second local oscillator at 10.8 megs and a second mixer and that brings it down the IF down to 100 kilohertz. The rest of the IF strip had got no coils in it, it was all RC coupled. There was quite a lot of transistors in it and uh, and the detector was over here somewhere. Now, somehow the audio got from here up to the volume control, which is here, and over to the audio amp, which is over here. And that fed the little loudspeaker or transducer, whatever. I don't know what the audio output was. It wasn't very much. There was also an earphone takeoff for privacy or use in noisy environments. It was only a 75 milliamp hour battery, which would only last about three hours of continuous receive. So the rig had a battery saver, which is approximately here. I think these are the battery saver transistors. I might be wrong, they might be the output. I, I really, it's 40 years since I've played with these, so I can't remember and I don't have a circuit to hand. So apologies if I get some of this wrong, but it's it's sort of around here anyway. The battery saver switched the receiver on for approximately 60 milliseconds. And if no signal was present, it switched off again for 600 milliseconds. If, but if a signal was received, the receiver would stay active for two seconds after the last signal ended. And then it would resume battery saving it on, off. On, off. This allowed it to last, last for a typical 8 hour shift and maybe up to 20 hours with no signals. It made a gentle ticking noise when there was no signal and the rate of tick varied quite a lot from set to set. Sometimes they were manic and sometimes they were really really relaxed. The problem with the battery saver if it's too relaxed, you tend to miss the start of the transmission. Now disassembly. Well, I think the first thing to do is to pop the aerial out of its slot and then pop that end up. And then the board could be slid out, turned over. You can see here's the charging connections going to the battery. Contacts are actually still in good condition on this one. And the battery feed to the board. And this is the feed that takes the audio output to the centre pin for use with the Pi Night Core or the car chart car adapter. These, these are all original, these wires. I think this is the one that takes the audio from
from the ratio from the discriminator pulse counting discriminator to the audio circuits again there's um there's a serial number there I think there's a pair of diodes being added there at some point as a, as a sort of a audio limiter um, probably to limit the squelch crashes as this has got a 50 kilohertz filter the squelch crashes will be quite a lot louder than the audio so uh, I mean, it is possible to change these filters you can undo these two and these two somewhere around there and, and drop it out let's have a closer look at the board this trimmer tunes the front end the aerial circuit this this tunes the collector of the first uh, RF transistor and that tunes the input of the first mixer so that's that's a bandpass pair they're very interdependent these two that one is more just pick it up these two require a bit more fiddling to get them right and then you've got the frequency adjustment for the crystal for the first first oscillator crystal and the tank adjustment for the first oscillator um, to pick up the uh, the injection right there. I don't think there's any more there's no more adjustments on the bottom there so there's not really a lot more to say about that is there not that I can think of here's where this where the nuts go to fix the, the screening cannon and as you can see they've been soldered because these little nuts they got lost they tended to get lost and if they didn't get lost these got strip threaded or the nuts got strip threaded so most people just put a blob of solder on to hold the can in place you had to tune these with the can in place it would, you, if you tune them with the can off the moment you put the can on it wouldn't tune this is just a view of the IF strip again everything is um, is off the board on these little bits of silicon rubber sleeving I don't know why they've done that but this this sleeving is actually still in very good condition after all this time and again as with the transmitter these carbon resistors tend to drift all over the place so they might now bear no resemblance to their original values that was a bit of a, a nuisance with these what's that one Essex yeah they tended to have their own brand of transistors And some of these around here were geranium, sorry, germanium transistors. So if they popped, you had a bit of a problem. But they are, you know, there's plenty of replacements available. They're not critical. The assembly is a little bit fiddly, but I shall attempt to do that. And I've found my glasses. First of all, you need to locate this end of the PCB in there below these contacts and then this end there's a little thing there and there's a little thing there and that has to push into that it's gone so we can locate the plate aerial in its little slots and then we can put the back on
Yeah. Taking care to locate the aerial in these slots here. Sorry about the... Push it together. Screws in. Dome up. Job done. That's pretty much it for the Pi Pocket Phone Receiver. In a later video I want to power these things up and I shall be doing some tests on them like sensitivity and range and stuff like that. These uh, were supposedly around about 1 microvolt PD for 12 dB Synad. No, which is absolutely terrible by today's standards. But they could be made better by sticking a BFY90 or some sort of modern transistor in place of the first RF device. There were another, you could probably change the, um, the first mixer as well for a better device. And I've even known people to change the first IF transistor and get um, better results. But there you have it, the Pi Pocket Phone 1 receiver. I hope you enjoyed this rather rubbish video. If you liked it, give me a thumbs up so that I know you're out there. If you didn't like it, give me a thumbs down. And tell me why in the comments. Just take that few moments to tell me why. And then I can get better. Thanks for watching. Bye.